Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mohala from the STAR Events team, and I'm pleased to be your host for the session this morning. Thank you for joining this webinar on why ESG, a governance perspective. This one hour session is organized by STAR Media Group and supported by TM and OCBC Bank. This webinar is also endorsed by the new Ministry of Natural Resources, Environment and Climate Change, NRECC, and it is streamed live on Zoom and on our Starbees and Star Facebook pages. Thank you to everyone who's tuning in right now. Do share our Facebook live link with any of your colleagues, friends, or family who may be keen to join us this morning and may find it useful. All right, a few quick housekeeping matters before we get into the webinar. As everyone dials in to this webinar through different internet bandwidths and devices, you may or may not experience minor technical glitches. So please be patient if there are any. And to minimize the risk of technical glitches, all participants have been muted and video cam turned off by default. But do participate by posting questions to our speakers or panelists. You may send in your questions at any time during the session. Click on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and post your questions there if you're using Zoom. And for those who are joining us on Facebook, you can place your questions in the comments section. There will be a short survey at the end. So to those joining us on Zoom, please help us by taking a few minutes to complete it. Your feedback will help us curate more events to suit your likes and needs. Lastly, and most importantly, please engage, learn and enjoy. We are here today to hear from three panelists and moderator who are very well versed in the area of governance with many years of hands-on experience, either as board members, directors, trainers, speakers and consultants in governance. They strive to put in place best practices for good governance at their respective organizations. And we hope that you can learn from them today. Our panelists this morning comprise Dr. John Zinkin, who is a certified training professional. His specialities are leading brand-based change, reconciling leadership and governance, and ethics in business. He has led board effectiveness evaluations in banking, insurance, and government entities, and has written codes of conduct and board charters for several development banks. Since 2007, he has trained more than 1,700 directors in CG, corporate governance, as well as senior managers of public listed companies. And he has trained securities regulators from Cambodia, Hong Kong, Laos, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam on behalf of the Australian government as part of the CG capacity building programs in ASEAN and APEC. In 2006, he set up the Securities Industry Development Corporation, SIDC, the training arm of the Securities Commission Malaysia. In 2011, he was appointed Managing Director, Corporate Governance of the ECLIF Leadership and Governance Center under Bank Negara Malaysia, responsible for training directors of banks and insurance companies in CG. Since 2013, he, has, he works independently as Managing Director of Zinkin Ettinger Syndrome Berhad, a boutique consultancy specializing in CG, brand-based change, and ethical leadership. His most recent publications, co-authored with Chris Bennett in 2022, are The Challenge of Leading an Ethical and Successful Organization, Criminality and Business Strategy, Similarity and Differences. And now we come to the second panelist, Datin Sri Sunita Rajakumar, who's a strong advocate of the importance of governance in general and risk management in particular. She is Chairman of Climate Governance Malaysia, which is the country chapter of the World Economic Climate Governance Initiative, the second in the world and first in Asia Pacific. She is chairman of Bursa Lisset Dutch Lady Milk Industries, independent non-executive director at Petronas Chemicals, HSBC Malaysia, MCIS Insurance and Zurich General Insurance, as well as trustee of six charitable foundations. She is fellow of the Institute of Corporate Directors Malaysia, member of the Global Advisory Board of Nottingham University School of Business, adjunct professor in Climate Governance and Sustainability, UNITA International University, and sits on the advisory panel of the UN Global Compact Malaysia Sustainability Center of Excellence. And our third panelist today is Tunku Munir bin Tunku Muzani, who, who was appointed Chief Corporate and Regulatory Officer, CCRO, of TM on 1st Jan January 2023. Prior to his appointment as CCRO, he served as TM's Chief Strategy Officer from 1, 1st of August 2019 to 31st December 2022. He has over 22 years experience in strategy, regulatory, sustainability, marketing and sales, branding, retailing, and customer service and experience. Aside from holding various positions in Salcom and Malaysia Airports Holdings Perhad, 
He was also the Chief Strategy and Implementation Officer at All Tel Holdings Syndrome Berhad, where he was instrumental in the rollout and completion of the nat National Digital Terrestrial Television Project. At present, he's also a director in Mobicom Syndrome Berhad, a wholly owned subsidiary of TM. And to moderate this session, we have Ms. Karen Chan, who is the Director of Education Studies at the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network Asia Headquarters at Sunway University, where she currently spearheads a global project known as Mission 4.7 to transform K-12 education by making sustainable development a key feature of national curriculums. She is also active in the solutions-driven project in building sustainable cities and communities. Without further ado, I'm pleased to invite Karen, our moderator for today, to commence the discussion. Over to you, Karen. Thank you so much, Mohala. A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Karen Chand, and I represent the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, or SDSN. It is a global nonprofit established 10 years ago under the auspices of the UN Secretary General that contributed to the adoption of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. It is led by Professor Jeffrey Sachs and its Asian headquarters is hosted in Sunway University, Malaysia. SDSN mobilizes scientific and technical expertise from academia, civil society and the private sector for solutions oriented problem solving. It is made up of a network of more than 1,700 knowledge-based institutions around the world. And we are very delighted this morning to partner with the STAR to bring you this webinar, Why ESG, a Governance Perspective. ESG stands for Environmental, Social and Governance. It is a set of criteria that are used to evaluate the sustainability and ethical impact of an organization. In Malaysia, ESG has become increasingly important as investors seek to align their investments with their values and to promote sustainable development. Our discussion today will revolve around the governance perspective, factors that relate to a company's leadership and management practices, this includes things like board composition, uh, compensation, stakeholder rights, um, anti-corruption measures, um, transparency and accountability. But more importantly to me, governance determines the decisions and the actions of the organization that can potentially impact the environmental pillar of ESG, such as greenhouse gas emissions, water usage, waste management, uh, renewable energy adoption, biodiversity conservation, and the list goes on, as well as the social pillar of ESG, things like labor standards, human rights, um, diversity and inclusion, um, community relations, health, poverty, inequality, access to education. So we have with us this morning a very eminent panel that promises an insightful and very interesting discussion indeed. And um, I would like to leave sufficient time to take questions from our audience within this hour that we have. So I would like to begin by inviting Dr. John Zinkin, Managing Director of Zinkin Attinger, to tell us about the challenge of leading an ethical and successful organization. John, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much. Can you all hear me? I'm not, I'm okay, right. Good morning, everybody. As Karen said, basically ESG covers pretty much everything that you can think about. But what I'd like to do is to actually talk about, first of all, what a board has to do. So the first responsibility of a board, which they don't often, uh, remember is to set strategy and refreshing it when the context changes. What does that mean? First, they have to define the mission of the company or the organization. They then have to articulate that to the outsiders and also to everybody within the organization to make sure they're on track. And then they need to, uh, to define the values 
uh, that doesn't seem to be working, unfortunately. Uh, like define the values and make sure if that's actually one of the most important things that they need to make sure about, because the values should be evergreen. The strategy can change, the vision can change, but the values that the company and the organization lives by should not change. Then, of course, what boards spend a lot of their time doing is to review performance, setting KPIs, auditing that performance, and then hopefully following up on corrective actions. Sometimes they don't follow up as much as they should. They leave it to management and then you get a delay and then you get problems. They need to create, they need to do three things. One, create value in reviewing performance, which is to focus on the customer. They then need to extract value, which means they're assessing whether the board, the management are actually focusing on productivity. And of course, as a board, they have to distribute the value and that reflects the shareholder, stakeholder risk reward profiles and get straight into much of the debate about ES and G, particularly in the United States now, where the uh, Republican Party and the right wing are pushing back against ES and G and saying the only thing that matters is shareholder value. And that obviously is not true, but that's part of the political problem that we're facing now. Obviously, also, if you're talking about sustainability, they must manage risk, asking what if questions as, what, as well as what happened questions. And the mindset is quite different if you're talking about what if rather than what happened. We've learned that actually the most valuable thing is not what everybody believes it is. The most valuable asset is actually not the people. It's the reputation of the business, because you can have the best people in the business, as Enron did, or as SVB might have done, or Credit Suisse might have done, but the minute their reputation is challenged, everything goes to pieces. So reputation is the first risk that has to be protected. We've also learned from the global financial crisis, which we didn't understand before, and it's been repeated again in the last few weeks with SVB and Credit Suisse and the, 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 the problems the banks are facing, that boards must think about the systemic risk, which is in technical terms, the macroprudential risk that means that what happens if other people do the same thing? So that you get a, a situation where you get herding effects, people start pulling their money out because of contagion effects. And then you get what's called a tragedy of the commons, which is if everybody does the same thing, which is right for their business at the same time, the whole industry or the whole sector falls apart and they've damaged everything for everybody, which is actually what happened in 2008. And what people are wondering about right now, is it going to happen again as a result of the financial instability and what the central banks are doing in terms of raising interest rates? Then you have the systemic, sorry, then you have the, uh, the operational risk, which is the business and operations effects. That's the microprudential risks across the value chain. We then, move on to, uh, that's the business operational risk, right, across the value chain. We then move on to planning succession. Obviously, the board needs to make sure it's got the right people in the board. It's got to deal with the diversity issues as well as inclusion. Again, a politically contentious and sensitive thing, but it needs to also think about making sure that the board balance is right, not just on the diversity and inclusion, but because you've got the right skills and the right experience. If you have too diverse a board who don't understand the business, you get in trouble. If you have an, an undiverse board and the world is changing, you also get into trouble because their experience doesn't reflect the need for change. At the same time, you have to make sure that the company's plan of succession is correct, that you have the appropriate talent management suited to changing the organizational design. Then it comes to the regulatory issues, which are basically ensuring compliance, which I prefer to call investing in the license to operate. And I'll talk about that on the next slide in a minute. And finally, you, so you've got the regulatory and legal things. And finally, you have the code of conduct, which has to reflect the code, the agreed values. And the important point about the agreed values is that they should be translated into observable, measurable behavior and KPIs so that people know what they're supposed to do, can live them, and management and supervisors can actually make sure that people are going to uh, be developed and assessed in line with the values, as opposed to the values just being something on the, on the, in the entrance and on mugs and, uh, and uh, other lit literature. But lastly, and that's the most difficult thing of all, is engaging stakeholders. This is where the whole ES&G thing becomes highly contentious. 
because you're trying to prioritize and reconcile different needs. For example, you know, Larry Fink of BlackRock is now having to defend the fact that BlackRock says ES and GE matters because he's being attacked by politicians in the United States. So what am I saying? I'm saying that actually we need to invest in the license to operate. And that means rethinking risk and compliance. Compliance is re regarded as a dirty word. I say compliance is as follows. The C is for a culture promoting character. That's the way you deal with the values and the integrity of the people who are working in the business. That you have an O for observing the values, making sure that actually what's happening is actually what the, is reflected in the values that you monitor behavior, that you perform, that your performance indicators are in line with the values. <clears throat> in investment banking, often that is not the case. Investment bankers say customers come first, but actually all they care about is doing the deal and afterwards the problems are the customer's problems. Legislation obviously needs to be obeyed. Integrity, not just integrity of people, but integrity of processes as well, because if the processes are bad, the processes will destroy the ability of the people to deliver the values. Accountability, that people must be empowered and must be held accountable for what they do. But at the same time, you have a no broken windows approach. So any minor infringement of the value should be punished so that people understand that this really matters. The code of conduct should then be enforced regardless of seniority. Shouldn't say this person is a big promoter and bringer of value, of value to the business, and therefore we will overlook the breaches of the or the code, that's the quickest way of saying your values don't matter. And then finally, the ESG risk exposures must be recognized. So actually there are two E's, there's enforcement and the ESG risk exposures, which I'll talk about in the next slide. So recognize that compliance is actually investing in the license to operate. It is about protecting your brand, it's about protecting your reputation, it's about above all protecting your market capitalization. So it is not, just the cost of satisfying regulators, which is how too many people actually believe it is. Now, here comes a rather complicated slide. Reconciling board responsibilities, management priorities, and uh, policies and ESG exposures and stakeholder priorities across the organization covers the whole value chain and needs to be done to, to have sustainable success. So let me just start off with sustainable performance. The first part of that is the responsibility of the boards. As I said before, they must set a sustainable mission, not just how much money do we make in the next quarter or the next two or three years. They must then articulate that as a compelling vision. They must set and supervise the values. They have to reconcile the need to create value. That's about being effective and sustainable in the future being efficient, in other words, to extract value, and then at the same time, reconcile those different stakeholders position regarding the distribution of that value. To do that, they need to align their operations in terms of achieving the mission and vision through the purpose of the business, making sure that the principles, i.e. the values are aligned, the power, the organizational design and structure is aligned, that the people, they have the right number of people with the right skills and with the right character, and finally, that they have the right processes to take the business towards the mission and vision. Obviously, then they must comply with regulations, they must then engage the stakeholders, and they must set the boundaries between what is the responsibility of the board and what are the responsibility of management. So management then come in to delivering the performance through the management policies. And here we come to ES and G. The environment, three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, and actually in a fourth, there's a fourth one, which is remanufacture. All of this is trying to achieve more outcomes with less resources. Then in terms of the society, there should be no corruption. We should obey the laws. We should pay the taxes that are due instead of always trying to seek to minimize tax and go offshore. That's politically and socially unethical. To avoid politics. So that's the S. Then the workplace itself is a combination of society and governance. So diversity and inclusion. Try and make it purposeful as opposed to just target, meeting targets. Use a meritocratic pay for performance approach, respect union rights, cover good working conditions and hours, and make sure there's no success as sexual har harassment. Do you see this is already just in terms of the policies and the board responsibilities, a very complex and complicated process. How does it work? We have to think about the ES and G risk exposures. 
So then they come across the value chain. So you have, first of all, raw materials processing. Then you have shipping and transport. Then you have production. Then you have distribution. Then you have marketing and sales. And basically, the environmental issues for the whole of the value chain until we get to marketing and sales are pretty much the same. They're about depletion, they're about pollution, they're about environmental damage, whether it's forestry, watersheds, waste, and greenhouse gas emissions. When we get to marketing and sales, there are a few more things. There's green marketing linked to World Wildlife Fund. There's the Marine Stewardship, there's Council, Marine Stewardship Council and Sustainable Forestry. The issue then becomes, are they just greenwashing? And of course, from a Malaysian perspective, there's the round, table of, the round table for sustainable palm oil and all those other issues in terms of what are we doing with our forests. And by the way, it's not just enough for the board of the company that's in doing in all of this to worry about it. It's true also for the banks and the professional services suppliers and providers to those companies to wonder how well they're doing their risk ESG risk exposure so they don't get blowback when things go wrong in their client. As far as society is concerned, again, it's the, pretty much the same right across. It's a dealing with corruption. There is the issue of social inequality, which we see increasingly important in the developed world. That's why you've had MAGA, that's why you've had Trump, that's why you've had Boris Johnson and Brexit, that social inequality is beginning to be a serious issue. And of course, in countries like Malaysia and Indonesia, there's the abuse of Indonesian in the, of the Orang Asli. So that's the issue all the way through till you get to marketing and sales, where then the issue is additionally not just corruption, but truthful selling, ethical marketing, fair pricing, and going back to the issue of tax avoidance. As far as the workplace is concerned, the issues are the same right across the board. Discrimination, human rights, union rights, health and safety, uh, sexual harassment, and working hours. So as you can see, this is a pretty complicated and complex agenda. And one of the problems that people who are attacking ESG are saying, and they have a point, is that it is very difficult to measure the externalities. And therefore, boards, when they're looking at this, they have one measure, which is called profitability, which they can measure now and under understand, but they don't have measures that they can understand all the tools to, to measure those things properly at the moment across the ESG risk exposure across their value chain. So if I may just say this and in complete in finishing, you know, this is a really difficult subject. It's not as simple as people think it is, and that's why people are having so many difficulties. So I've just covered the what, the next speakers will be covering the how. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. John. If I may just, um, in the time that's remaining, just bring up one question to you. Um, so you you talked about, you know, the, the gamut of issues that boards, leadership and management have to consider. Yeah. Um, one of the, the main challenges in Malaysia is the lack of awareness among companies yeah. and investors about the importance of ESG. And um, many are still focused solely on financial performance. Mm. Um, they may not fully understand the impact of ESG issues on their operations and their reputation. Um, could you briefly share with us how do you think this can best be addressed? Well, before I do that, if I could just make one additional point, which is, again, think of and be, be sympathetic towards independent, not, not the management, but the independent non-executive directors. Independent non-executive directors typically, if they're in a very conscientious company, only have maybe half a day once a month. In less conscientious companies, they have half a day once a quarter. In that time, they have to understand the operational issues, all the things that I said in the first slide. Do they have time to do anything with being aware? Because it, you've already understood it's a very complicated set of issues. And it's changing all the time as different things happen, whether it's crises in industry or it's climate change accelerating. And they don't have, they, they don't have uh, people who can explain to them what they're supposed to do when they face this challenge. To raise awareness, obviously, the one that's easy, that you've got two that are right now that are really staring us in the face. First of all, environment. I mean, you know, everybody now, I think, understands that 
climate change is real. The IPCC has said we, this is our last chance only this week. And in terms of governance, we've just had a great reminder by you know, SVB. You know, what was the board doing allowing such a concentration of risk? You know, by having that just one industry, A, all together, who all know each other and who all are very tech savvy and therefore can cause a run on the bank in, in 48 hours. So that's, sorry, that was my, my timer. Um, so, so that's the issue. I think the governance thing must be coming back pretty clearly right now because of Credit Suisse as well. I mean, these are, these are governance failures that have caused a, a sort of tragedy of the commons and herding uh, crisis. And we've got environment. On the social side and on the diversity and inclusion side, um, I, I personally and my co-author, we, we both think we're actually doing the wrong thing. Uh, it isn't just about meeting quotas and targets. It's about making sure that diversity is appropriate for the, for the strategy of the business. So, for example, if a business is a startup, it doesn't need diversity. It needs focus and concentration of like-minded people, right? If a business is trying to grow, it needs diversity to get the extra resources in. But at a certain point, we discovered that when you're too big, the diversity leads to dissension and it causes breakdown. I give you a simple example. Take the EU, which started as just two people in 1950, a German and a Frenchman, trying to stop war. It grew and it grew and it grew till it got to 28 members. And then one member, the UK, said, we can't stand this anymore because we don't agree with half of the things that you're trying to do. So we're going to leave. Now that was done, they self-excluded, but it happens in businesses all the time. When you get too big, you get factions because you can afford to have factions. And then you get the problem of civil war in the organization. The same thing happens when you acquire another company. If you acquire another company, and I give you an example, you acquire a BP, acquired Amoco in, a, in the United States. Now, before the acquisition of Amoco, BP, BP the Anglo-Scottish company, had one of the best safety records because they really cared about safety. When they acquired Amoco, they looked at the financials, they looked at the business, they looked at the, you know, the fit of the business, and they said, this is great. And they did it, and they made a huge change to themselves and to the industry. What they didn't know or what they didn't pay attention to was Amoco had a really bad culture for safety. Every one of the BP disasters, and there were some major ones, there was a disaster in Alaska, there was the Texas City uh, uh, refinery which blew up and killed 12 people, and then there was Deepwater Horizon, all in the Amoco legacy, because they were Amoco people who didn't pay enough attention to the, to the culture of safety. So when you're getting diversity, just think about two things. When you're bringing in new resources, it's like bringing in new blood, right? When you have a blood transfusion, you want to make sure there's no viruses in it. So that's one problem. The other problem is if you bring in a new CEO and he has a different culture or she has a different culture, as happened with the banks, they destroy the banks, the retail banks. They introduce uh, risk behavior, risky behavior that actually nearly destroyed the financial system in 2008. So be very careful what it is you're trying to get diversity for. Does that answer your question? Thank you so much, John. And, and thank you for, for bringing up one of the crises that's glaring all of us in the face, which is the one of climate. And on that note, I would like to invite uh, Datin Sunita, Datin Sri Sunita Rajakumar, Chair and Director of Climate Governance Malaysia to give us an introduction to climate governance. Sunita, thank over you. Thank you so much, Karen. That was such an informative briefing by Dr. John. Thank you so much. And thanks for the organizers for having us all here. This is such an important topic. So corporate governance, as we've heard Dr. John describe, is how you manage companies, the long-term stewards manage companies, identifying who has responsibility, accountability. But as recently as 1970, Nobel Prize winner Milton Friedman could still opine that the only responsibility of a company is to generate returns for its shareholders. And this is, a, this is still a very strongly held view by many investors today. And the social license to operate is limited to certain companies like rare earth mining or nuclear operations. But 
there is increasing knowledge about the impacts that businesses have on their multiple stakeholders, including workers and the environment. Mm -hmm. And so this social license to operate has now extended to all companies and has gathered significant momentum. So much so that allocators of capital are demanding for increased reporting and disclosure to assess if businesses have accurately identified the material risks they are facing and demonstrating that they are able to manage them. Because businesses are so complex, and even if they aren't, even if the business is simple, the world is increasingly becoming so complex. So you need a risk-based approach to establish the risk appetite, materialities, identify matters which have double or dynamic materiality. And the recent emphasis includes ethics, anti-corruption, and of course, my personal passion, climate governance, which as informed by science, the climate crisis is viewed as an existential risk. So this huge momentum that we've seen in the past few years is actually the first wave of establishing legal liab liability. Because the climate crisis, as informed by science, now is mainstreamed, it's recognized as an existential risk, is the responsibility of long-term stewards to ensure that these risks are managed and mitigated. It stands to reason that if we're facing an existential crisis, there's also tremendous opportunity to create value as well. So the first slide I wanted to share is that there's many aspects to the climate emergency, but what is very clear is that Malaysia and this part of the world is going to be disproportionately affected. Not just by extreme heat days, where you will not be able to spend three hours out of doors in the shade without suffering from heat stroke, and heat stroke causes irreversible brain damage, but also on the flip side, rising sea levels caused by warming as well, and rain bombs. So the incidence of flooding is also going to be increasing. And the, uh, the satellite imagery that I'm sharing with you here is, um, uh, is a forecast of what are the areas of land that is going to be underwater. So I said earlier that this is a climate crisis informed by science and many have interpreted this as we need to reach net zero by 2050, we need to half by 2030. This is what science had been informing us, but we've just experienced the warmest January on record. Many don't consider the 1.5 degrees target to be feasible. We are already at 1.2 degrees of warming. The world is currently headed to 2.4 or 2.7 degrees of warming. Simulations in indicate that even limiting to two degrees will be insufficient to prevent accelerated sea level rise. The United Nations Security Council has just had their first session to discuss security risks arising from sea level rise, which is climate refugees. And we've seen the World Bank president leaving his uh, post as well. So in my second slide, I want to describe to you the sort of physical and transition risks that we will be seeing. And this is where businesses are increasing their level of ambition not only to manage the physical risks and the transition risks, but also to embed sustainability into the DNA of their business. So in this whole spectrum, at one far end, you can have reporting and disclosure, where you understand what your baseline emission numbers are, and then you mm -hmm. can increase it by managing your risk, whether physical or transition risk, including shadow pricing of carbon, but at the far end of the spectrum, businesses which are embedding sustainability into their DNA. And what does this mean? From the product design, the circularity of the products, even after their useful life, deeply considering the impacts of business on the environment and planetary boundaries, such as chemicals, aerosols, microplastics, which we're generating. Many thought leaders within the business community are seeing this as an opportunity not only to widen the gap between leaders and laggards who still don't fully understand the enormity of the problem, and they are also contributing to policy making as a social responsibility, as this crisis requires an all of government, whole of society approach. 
so to this end, Climate Governance Malaysia mm -hmm. and the CEO Action Network are collaborating closely for a platform for engagement. Um, and mm -hmm. this is uh, some of the contributions that we can make. So I will leave it as that for now, Karen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunita. Um, we have some time, so I'm, I'm just going to jump in with just one question for you. And this was a point that John raised as well about, you know, license to operate versus mere compliance. Um, could you tell us what are your thoughts um, when it comes to the public's perception and the public's awareness and, and how they look at companies and set expectations for those companies, what would you say is that level of public awareness and public perception when they, you know, buy a good or service or, you know, support a particular organization? So I think this is very clearly an example of a classic market failure where the polluter profits and the rest of society has to bear the consequences. So what is becoming increasingly top of the agenda is that we not only need to ensure a smooth transition, we need to ensure a just transition, right? So it's not just about sinks and carbon sinks and biodiversity and ecosystem services, but also the huge cost of loss of lives, damage to property, extinction of species. It's just the right thing to do. And we need everyone to be involved in this conversation to crowdsource for simple, elegant, cost-effective, hyper-localized solutions and we need inevitable policy responses to urgently decarbonize the economy. So all of this is going to affect the man on the street, right? If we're going to decarbonize the grid and the economy, but fuel at the pump is vastly subsidized. If we say that we want to in incorporate shadow pricing and remember carbon tax alone has not worked in any country, we need a raft of highly specific and precisely defined policies and interventions to maneuver the economy in the intended direction of travel. Uh, this is going to affect um, our, our current way of living, right? But the fact is that the earth simply cannot support, cannot sustain both population growth and economic growth as we currently understand this. So this is going to affect every single person. How, the sooner we manage this, the less painful it is going to be on all of us. Thank you for highlighting that market failure that exists and the urgent need for it to be addressed. Um, last but not least, I would like to invite uh, Tunku Munir, Tunku Muzani, to give us the organization's perspective. Um, he's the Chief Corporate and Regulatory Officer at Telecom Malaysia. Congratulations, Tim Kuhl, on your recent appointment. And he will give us a case study on TM's governance structure for ESG. Over to you, Tim Kuhl. Thank you, Karen. Hi, everyone. Um, circling back to, to my esteemed panelists, uh, they spoke about um, the principles um, on ESG. Um, I'd like to share with you a little bit more on the how and what we have done. Uh, at Telecom Malaysia with regards to the implementation of our ESG. Yeah? I mean, let's, let's start um, with the governance uh, at TM in terms of uh, our structure, our organization structure. How do we execute and how do we make things happen? Now, if, if you look at this, this chart, um, we are governed by the board of directors, right? In this case, um, with regards to ESG, the Board of Directors provides um, the sustainability strategy uh, and approves all sustain sustainability-related decisions. Now, what happens after that? There is a subcommittee um, under the risk uh, um, uh, committee, which is the uh, Board Risk Committee. And what they do, they ensure the translation into what has been said by the board and to ensure effective integrations of the sustainability agenda into the enterprise risk management. Yeah? So this is quite important because um, any organization, especially in Malaysia, it is a journey. It is not something that you set up overnight. I will share with you in the next couple of slides on, on, on our journey. But I think just to establish a position today, it needs to be governed at the board level as well as the BRC. Now, as you go further down the value chain, 
we have the management committee. Now, the management committee is headed by the group CEO. Now, this is where uh, we provide at management level, we provide the leadership direction, setting the sustainability vision and strategy. And also, very importantly, it's where strategy meets implementation. So this is where all the de deployment of the effective strategies happen. Yeah, And this is driven by the working group, the sustainability action working group. They are the ones that will provide the feed, the information, the details, the collating to the management committee for further action. Now then comes further down the value chain, this is where my division comes in. Um, previously, we had the chief risk officer managing sustainability, but I think as we evolve as an organization, sustainability becomes a very specific pillar in the organization that needs to be taken up directly, taken up very specifically by a division. In this case, it's the CCRO. Now, what we do here, um, we are responsible for developing and implementing all sustainability strategies as well as implementation plan. And from there, it translates into the business clusters. Um, TM is an organization with different businesses. We have our B2B, B2C, carrier to carrier, uh, we also have subsidiaries and we also have other divisions that are non-business related. And each of them will have sustainability champions. Now, these sustainability champions will oversee very specific sustainability opportunities um, in the organization. And from that sustainability opportunities, what we do, we have um, the, um, the stewards. The stewards provide collating, provide all the data points so that we can, we can analyze it and we can actually take the next step in order for us to improve our position on the ESG front, yeah? So, I mean, in a nutshell, that is how TM operates in terms of the sustainability agenda. And, and bear in mind, it is a board agenda. Uh, we do report to the board very regularly on our sustainability programs. So it is something as, um, um, it is considered as one of the key uh, metrics aside from the business itself. Yeah. So can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. I said earlier, it is a journey. Um, we, we did not start from where I presented earlier. What, if I were to go pre-2020, um, ESG has always been integrated into our annual reports, um, but it is headed by the group corporate comms now. Um, I, I, I realize a lot of people wonder why is it good corporate comms? Because at that point of time, we have recognized sustainability as a key agenda that is going to emerge. And the comms team are the ones that will put together our, our uh, collating on the SDGs and they translate it into action and they translate it into communications to our TM uh, employees. Yeah. Now, moving up, to 2020, this is where sustainability becomes a key pillar and a board agenda. Now you can see the difference between where it was before. Before it was a management agenda. Come 2020, it has become a board agenda. And, and what happened was we established the sustainability unit in the group risk management as part of the enterprise risk management um, uh, 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 agenda yeah, under the ERM. Now, we, in the next couple of years, you can see that we, we evolve fairly quickly because I think um, as climate change starts to hit uh, the world, you know, governance principles start to become a, a major concern. In 2021, we embedded ESG as one of the TM's purpose under our new compass. In TM, we have a compass. The compass provides the direction for all TM employees on what we need to do, where we are heading. Now, ESG is one of it, one of the key purpose. Now, we developed uh, um, uh, the TM ESG uh, vision and commitment. And today, uh, at that point of time, it was carried by the chief risk officer and the GCO. Those are the KPIs that um, these two senior management team members carry in Telecom Malaysia. Now, the objective at the time was aligning itself to FTSE Russell. And also, we align ourselves to FTSE for good under. Uh, uh, Bursa Malaysia to measure our performance. We always have a performance metrics. Um, and we also started to embark into the CDP and, uh, disclosure. 
Now, come 2022, 2022 was a key year where ESG is cascaded into all the sea level KPIs. So ESG is in every one of our um, uh, key performance index and metrics is measured. Each and every one of us will carry a very specific measure under each of the ESG agendas that we carry here. Yeah? Now come 2023, we created a very specific sustainability group. Now it's no longer under the risk. Now it is under the corporate and regulatory. Now, at the same time, in 2023, two things happened. We came up with the materiality assessment and we started to incorporate this into our ESG agenda. And come 2023, in the next couple of months, you're gonna see we're gonna be the first to publish, the, uh, we're gonna be uh, uh, publishing our first TCFD report. So that will come in uh, um, uh, later yeah, in the year. Now, if you move on to the next slide. Now, throughout this journey, um, we have always had a clear understanding of what we need to do. Now, TM balances itself between a public listed company and a government-linked company, and there are a multitude of SDG elements that we do carry, and it translates into the ESG. Now, um, on, on the first part, on the environmental part, um, we have our commitments with regards to emissions reduction, 30% uh, um, by 2024 and 45% by 2030, and net zero emission by 2050. This is, this is already ratified at the board level. On social, it is more focused towards the social prosperity and livelihood. This is where we have that part of the GLC agenda um, uh, that we drive towards the social side. Now, at least in this case, at least 70% of premises with fiber internet access by 2025. Now, I think we all can anchor that quite similarly to what uh, Jandela is, but we have already established this way earlier. Um, then, of course, all our partners, all our vendors must comply with ESG by 2024. In this case, 50% of mid-tier mid -tier partners must comply with our ESG by 2030. And of course, we have, I think, 30% uh, women uh, at the, on the board. By 2025, we already have about 36% today. So I think we've, we've pretty much fulfilled some of this agenda. Now, on the governance side, I, I noticed there are some questions as well on the governance. Um, I'll also provide uh, an answer at the same time. The low-hanging fruits with regards to governance um, is very much establishment of the code of conduct. Yeah. So the code of conduct here focuses on ethics, integrity, and transparency. Now, what we do is that we have a zero tolerance policy for corruption. Um, I think for, for, for those who don't know, we do have an MACC person in uh, um, Telecom Malaysia at the group uh, um, Integrity and Governance. They oversee, they also ensure um, that this code of conduct is followed. Now. The other one is establishment of the OACP and ABMS. Now we established this about two years ago. Um, um, these are the anti-corruption uh, uh, disclosures as well as a clear corporate governance agenda at the board. You don't need to have a committee, but whatever that happens at the board, our charters, management, there has to be a very clear demarcation on uh, integrity and governance. Yeah, And of course, we are, we are focusing on the TCFD disclosure by this year. Now we have uh, achieved um, good ratings, but again, um, we do not like to rest on our laurels. We like to challenge ourselves. Um, we have a CDB rating of B. Um, we have a supply engagement rating of A minus. Um, we are focusing on moving that, moving up the value chain. On FUSI for good, we are four out of four. Now, because we're already four out of four in FUSI for good, we decided to actually focus on FUSI Russell. How do we actually move up the value chain on FUSI Russell as well? Yeah. So I guess this is where, um, as a corporate, um, we need to look at it um, uh, holistically. We need to look at it pragmatically. If you want to move up the value chain, what do you need to do? And these are the structures that we set up in order for us to, uh, to be able to um, um, uh, um, um, uh, reach whatever objective that we want to do. Yeah. So I guess I think with that, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll close off and I'll open this up more towards uh, uh, Q and A in conversations. Um, then thank you very much, Karen. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tengkulunir, um, for sharing 
PM's journey with us. Uh, and thank you also for already addressing one of the questions that was in the Q&A from, from one of our audience members. Uh, just to, to follow up a little bit on that question um, with regards to low-hanging fruit, um, there was also a comment in the chat box from, from one of our audience members about you know, startups and smaller organizations. And you know, given um, Dato John's illustration of the complexities of setting up a sound governance structure to incorporate ESG, uh, if you were to give some advice uh, from the perspective of a very large organization to a smaller one uh, when it comes to low-hanging fruits. Could you just elaborate a little bit on what, what, what can they do? Sure, Karen. Um, I think, it, you know, let's, let's, let's be pragmatic about it. Um, as a large organization, um, we've already had uh, quite a number of governance pillars that has been established uh, through experience. Um, and of course, we have our BAC and, and so forth. Now, uh, for startups, um, as I said earlier, I think at, at the start, you can anchor this on an OECP document. Yeah, you can start with that because I think I think as a, a governance pillar, um, the simplest one you can do is very much on corruption. Yeah, uh, that will be the simplest, the lowest hanging fruit, uh, best business practice. Um, um, this is what I think we should be focusing on. It, it is it is not a one size fits all sort of answer. But let, let me share with you our experience when we started ESG um, uh, back in the day. Um, we realized when we, when we established this ESG, we were already practicing some of it in our business. Um, in the interest of um, efficiency, in the interest of uh, better cost management. For example, I'll give you a simple example. Um, our equipment uh, at the network side. Um, there are some equipment on the network side that now runs on solar. Now, the reason why we do it is because um, it was also best business practice in, in, in the sense that if we look at the cost, right, it costs more for us to be to travel far to the site. Usually it's, it's only remote sites, right? We go far into the remote sites to replace a battery or to replenish the diesel uh, as backup. And why don't you just establish um, um, a, a solar panel? Now, in that sense, right, it, it, is a, it is a business idea, but it falls into the bucket of environmental protection. And I think when we realized that, it was a eureka moment. Uh, and, and what we did thereafter was, hey, you know, why don't we just enhance our, our uh, business equipment? We enhance um, uh, uh, our current business model in order for us to want be better for the environment. Second is lower cost. So I, I think sometimes it depends on, on what business you're in. You will be able to see this and you will be able to map it and put it in the bucket under e either one of it, ESG. But I think as, as I said earlier, the simplest one is to establish an, an, uh, uh, an OECP. You can anchor that. And, and that is something that is very important. Uh, corruption is an issue. So I think this is something that you can stamp very quickly and, and pretty much you can establish it immediately in the organization. So I, I hope that answers the question. Thank Karen, you so much. Karen, can I come in on, on this? A couple of points to Please support do, yes. what Tunku is saying, but at the same time to provide a caveat. Um, there's, a, there's a very, very good book which came out in 1999 called Natural Capital which shows how a lot of the, the things that you do for climate change actually are good at reducing your cost by dramatic amounts. So anybody who's interested, I recommend that they, they download that book. You can get it on the, on the internet as an ebook, Natural Capital by Amory and uh, Hunter Lubbins. One thing, I, you know, Tunku is absolutely right about corruption, but the problem small companies have when they're competing uh, or sort of trying to get into business is often they find that if they do, they're not recognized, their product isn't known, the only way they can get a foothold in is to do something that is corrupt. So we need to recognize that fact and they're under tremendous pressure because what they're going to be facing is a conflict of two ethical principles. The yeah. first ethical principle is you should not be corrupt. That's obviously correct. I mean, and Islam makes it absolutely clear that corruption is one of the sins that can never be forgiven. 
Um, you know, he who organizes a bribe, he who give, uh, takes a bribe, and he who offers a bribe will burn in hell forever. So, you know, really, every religion says it's bad. But at the same time, if you don't get the business, your employees lose their jobs and their families starve. So you have two conflicting uh, ethical principles. So it's not quite as easy as people think it is in practice. That's all I would say. The last point I would make, going back to Datin Shri's uh, thing on climate, and again, it shows that it's all more difficult. She made the point absolutely correctly that Milton Friedman in 1970 did what I think is one of the most immoral things in history, which is to say the only thing that matters is shareholder value. In 1965, Exxon and the oil companies knew exactly what was going to happen with climate change this year. They predicted it. There was a 1965 report to President Lyndon Johnson saying that they had to change, otherwise climate change would happen the way it has. What is so awful about that is that half of all carbon emissions in the whole of mankind's time came since 1988. If we dealt with it properly in 1965, we would not have the problem we have now. And that lies at the fault of the oil and gas companies who said the only thing that matters is shareholder value. Thank you, John. I mean, sorry, um, uh, Sunita, Karen. I mean, just, just in closing, um, I did mention earlier that for our suppliers, we do require them to fulfill a certain ESG criteria. Now, for startups and SMEs, they do benefit on ESG where access to market is concerned. Mm -hmm. Today, most organizations uh, are looking at ESG criteria for the suppliers. And even with a simple ESG initiative, you will already have that additional advantage. Okay. So I think look at it as a business standpoint, don't look at it as you need to do this. Thank you. Absolutely. I cannot help but echo what Dr. John and Tengku Munir have been saying. Uh, there are, there's already a huge segment of business which is pivoting. And they understand that this is the direction of travel that all of society wants. So they're rising up to meet what society needs and wants. So let's take uh, Saudi Aramco as an example, 160 mm -hmm. billion of profits last year. But if you were to impute a carbon price of $100, they would be loss making. Now $100 carbon price is already what carbon is trading at in the EU and the UK. So this is why we have this segment of businesses. We have um, almost 5,000 subscribers to Climate Governance Malaysia newsletters. Mm -hmm. We have over 70 CEOs, uh, including Telecom, who are in the CEO Action Network and having made collective commitments at various levels of ambition for E and S and G already, right? So these leaders are really breaking away from what I call the laggards, who are still trying to understand what's going on, what do I do, how do I start, who are still asking those sort of questions. And the momentum has gathered so much pace that if you're looking at a price of carbon of $100 per tonne, many businesses are going to be out of business almost immediately. And allocators of capital who are reading your reports, they will immediately be able to understand who is capable of making this transition and who still doesn't even understand what this crisis is about, right? So I think that's, that's really important for the audience to understand. Thank you so much for that. There are a lot of questions that are coming in from the audience. So I, in the time remaining, I will have to be selective. Uh, Sunita, this one's for you. Uh, it comes from an anonymous attendee. Can ESG implementation get easier if selection of board members being reviewed incorporate competencies in ESG as one of their key prerequisites. So, you know, and I'm sure Dr. John and Tengku Munir have a lot to say about this. So that's um, a great question, actually. Yeah, exactly. Because directors are long-term stewards of the organization. So the op-ed that I wrote in the Edge last weekend and should be out online today or tomorrow, really um, pull back a little bit more, not just about ESG. We've got multiple tsunamis heading in our direction. I think what is really needed is critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. And many of our directors don't actually have that, right? So it's good, it's really great if you're well prepared, you read the board pack, you're ready, you understood what was discussed, you understand what's happening within the industry. Critical thinking skills helps you look around corners as well, helps you assess what's really going on. And then you can navigate the business accordingly because there's so many developments just in the last two, three years 
that are going to overwhelm businesses, that are going to put businesses and industries out of business, mm -hmm. or even regions. If you look at Southeast Asia, which is addicted to fossil fuels, and yet is the factory for the world, this part of the world with more than half of the world's population is the factory keeping cost of goods down. And yet you need your know, this pressure all the time to keep churning out goods which are cheaper, faster, better. So the tipping point will come is when they're not just cheaper, faster, better, but better for the environment as well. Nature friendly or nature prioritizing. So not just emissions, but extraction of resources from the environment, fresh water and so on and so forth. One of the biggest things that we're worried about is what is called climate endgame scenarios, where you not just have extreme heat days, extreme weather events, but geopolitical tensions, boundary disputes for fresh water, mass migration, food insecurity. How is the business going to pivot at that stage? You could be multi-award winning for reporting and disclosure, but if you don't have food, your staff can't come to work. What does it matter, right? So this is what's coming up. And there are many businesses that are in this conversation. So like I said, the gap between leader and laggard is only getting more and more. Thank you. Um, a related question, this comes from Edison Chung. I will let you answer this, John. Um, is diversity a necessity? Since as you pointed out, the case of Brexit had not been very positive. Um, perhaps there is no necessity for diversity, your thoughts. Um, it's an interesting, I'm glad they asked that question. I have, I'm afraid I have a very long answer because, because you know, Chris Bennett and myself were working on a book on making inclusive diversity work. What we've actually found, we, we started with, with biology and then we looked at empires and nation states before we got to businesses. We found something very interesting. At startup, diversity is not a good idea because you need everybody to be thinking the same way because you're under great pressure and you've got very little resource. When you grow, you actually need to have it to bring more people into the business, right, with different skills, with different backgrounds. And at a certain point, and it's true for political parties as well, right, you, you, you know, you need you need to win an election. So you could create coalitions and you've only got to see the mess the Conservative Party is in in the UK because the coalitions are fighting each other. And they've had, you know, three prime ministers in, you know, made Malaysia look really stable and wonderful. Um, so coalitions when they get too big, they have enough resource to start fighting each other. I worked for a very interesting company many, many years ago, which was Xerox. And Xerox had a very simple philosophy. We will recruit the best because we're a first-class company. And what they had was they, they created three cultures in the business. The people who knew how to sell photocopiers who were called Xeroids, the financial people who came from Ford, because in those days, back in the, I'm talking about the 80s, because I'm very old, right? They, they, they had people from Ford who were the financial controllers, because Ford in America had the best financial controls. And then they realized they had to sell systems and solutions, so they started recruiting people from IBM. Three cultures, three groups of people fighting each other rather than fighting the Japanese competitor. They spent more time on sabotaging their own work than on competing with the Japanese. So that's one of the things you have to remember. And it happens every time you have a merger, you know, there's a statement, what is it? That culture eats strategy for lunch and breakfast, uh, breakfast and lunch, you know? So that's the issue. The problem with diversity isn't, and I'm talking about, and we're talking, we were talking in our book about 27 versions of diversity. So it's not just gender, it's not just ethnicity, it's culture, it's religion, it's size, it's all sorts of things you really have to be careful and if you the way i would put it this way um if you as some people say diversity is about inviting people to the ball okay but when you invite them to the ball you have to actually ask them to dance because if you're just meeting a target or a quota you invite them to the ball and they sit there and they watch everybody else but if they only know how to dance the conga and the dance at the moment is the waltz they have a problem you have a problem and that's one of the problems of diversity it then becomes a bigger problem if you then tell the people, you are wrong because you only know how to dance the conga and this company dances the waltz. Because you're then disrespecting all their background, all their values, all everything in their experience that they come. And that's one of the reasons why so many people who followed or tried to include a, a lot of people are finding that they leave because they get disappointed because they keep being told you have to dance the waltz when they're actually great conga players or great uh, cha-cha people. 
So the, the issue then becomes, and this goes back to why when you have too many people in, it's so difficult, you need to understand why they, why they believe the conga is right rather than the waltz. You need to get into their backgrounds. You need to get into their family values, all sorts of things. And who has the time? You know, as I was saying at the beginning, we don't even have the time to do yes and G right. So if we've got to understand and really empathize and validate the different points of view, we're never going to do any business. And that's when diversity becomes a problem. The people spend too much time trying to placate the factions and don't get on with the job. Does that answer the question? Thank you, John. Um... Tunku Munir, this next one's for you. It comes from Lisa Marie. Um, how can companies in Malaysia practice good governance, especially in current situation of economic crisis? And how can government better create policies to encourage good governance? Yeah, um, that's a good question, actually. Um, as, as I said earlier, um, creating a um, 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 how shall I put it? Um, having good practice in corporate governance um, can open up to better business opportunities. You, have, you, you always have to think about that. Most companies now do not want to get involved in shady practices and shady companies today. I think the, the, the advent of social media is, is not very good for, for those who want to do otherwise. So I, think, I don't see a reason why we shouldn't. Uh, as I said earlier, even for telecoms, we, we do have certain criteria before a company will be able to even be our vendor. So these are, the, and, and we're not the only ones. So you're, you're probably going to be looking at, at other large corporates that will be practicing the same. And, and I guess uh, it provides you better opportunities. Now, if you split it into, into the large and the smaller organizations, for large organizations means more investors. Investors are much more confident to put in their money with you. They know that they're going to get their money's worth. And for the smaller ones, we know that we are going to get our money's worth as well because we are looking at a company that is has the right transparency, right integrity, right governance practice. Now, with regards to how the government wants to execute this, um, I think we do not want to over-regulate ourselves. We already have a lot of the existing uh, laws, existing platforms, um, for the government to establish this corporate governance. Thing. So, I mean, if, if you're a listed entity, you've got BRUSA, you've got Securities Commission. Uh, uh, for others, you also have MECC. Now, again, like I said, you, you, what you can do, you can always anchor on um, the current OECP that is already available today. You can establish that. You can go to MECC and say, can I, I'd like to establish an OECP principle. Um, and you can establish it yourself. It depends on what business you're in and what is your appetite. So, so I guess, I guess it, it, it sort of like goes hand in hand. You can start a governance principle. You can also, at the same time, practice governance uh, as you have today. So it, it is, it is um, there is no one size fits all. It depends on which business you're in, which sector you're in, uh, who do you deal with. If you, and, and my advice is if you want to deal with shady um, companies, you, you may want to think twice. You may want to try with the, with the, uh, the larger corporates first. You know, establish yourselves. Because we, we STM, we are looking for these sort of vendors. Yeah? These, are, these are the sort of people we'd like to do business with. So, so I, I think this is where, um, uh, for me, if I were to, to, to advise the SMEs, the smaller companies, don't overregulate. Start to build yourself. Start to do it yourself. It's, it's, it's actually a, a, a basic moral right? Uh, basic ethics, basic principles. You just need to apply it in your business. And it is good business. It's, it's not like before. ESG is good business. So I will, I will encourage that. Thank you for that, Tunku. We are out of time, uh, but I'm going to give the opportunity to all three of our panelists very succinctly um, your parting message in a few seconds, please. Let's start with you, John. Well, the fir first thing I would say, it's very hard work and you don't always get rewarded, unfortunately. I just give you one example. I, I agree with everything Tunku said about business eth based on eth ethical foundation is good business. There's just one caveat, I would say. Unilever, which was a company which was regarded as being the best company in the world on ESG, got hammered by one of its shareholders for losing the plot 
And now they've had to back off doing that because their share price dropped because they were spending too much time on ESG and not enough on profit. And they were hammered because Nestle and the others and Procter and Gamble, who didn't pay so much attention, were doing better in terms of profitability. So at the end of the day, as long as you have Americans around, you're going to have these people saying all that matters is profit until Milton Friedman is discredited. Uh, Sunita, um, your last takeaway. So everyone, whether in an SME or in your household, you can start by reducing the amount of energy that you're mm -hmm. using, reduce your electricity bill by 30 to 50%, make sure that you're a zero waste household or business, and be much more careful about the fresh water that you're using. Do you need to use portable treated water for everything? Or can you be harvesting rainwater and using that? Mm -hmm. And there's a whole spectrum of what businesses need to do in terms of reporting and disclosure. There are many frameworks. The Malaysian Guide for Corporate Governance is available. So the Malaysian Code for Corporate Governance. So I think there's plenty and really hardly any reason for businesses not to have already embarked on this journey. Thank you, Sunita. And last but not least, Tengku Munir, um, over to you for your parting message. Thank you, Karen. Um, my, my, my message to all is ESG is a journey. Yeah? It is still very new for us Malaysians. Um, take it one step at a time and based on whatever that you can adopt quickly, whatever that your appetite is, but ESG is good practice. ESG ensures that a company can prepare for rainy days uh, and it will remain resilient. Uh, it can have that competitive advantage and also better access to market, uh, be it in an economic crisis or even natural, natural disaster. But always bear, bear in mind that bad times will always come. So we need to be prepared, right? So this is, this is a good, uh, um, uh, it's good to establish this foothold that you are actually as ESG compliant. Yeah. So I guess I guess that's it. And it is a journey. You are in control. You need to take control. You need to take charge. But if you want to establish yourself into a bigger player later, you need to actually adopt this. You need to embrace this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to all three panelists for that that very, very eye-opening session. It was excellent indeed. Uh, I'm sorry that we were not able to answer all questions from the audience, but I think um, indirectly, most of the questions were addressed. And with that, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll pass it back to Mohala from the staff. Thank you. Thank you so much to our moderator, Karen, and also thank you to our panelists, uh, Dr. John Zinkin, Dr. Sri Sunita, and Tengku Munir for the very, very insightful um, presentations and also discussion. And I hope it was useful for everyone, especially those who are starting on their ESG journey. And as Tanko said, you know, it's, it, just embrace it and uh, you will have uh, challenges, but then I think uh, as you go along, it will be, you'll get a bit easier. And I believe you have also gained some valuable takeaways. So before we end, please help us complete the evaluation pool, poll, which will appear in the screen. And while you complete the poll, please scan the QR code on the screen to learn more about STARS ESG's monthly pullout um, and participate in the next round of the ESG Positive Impact Awards at our website, staresgawards.com.my. Um, we should be open for submissions by the third quarter at the earliest. Uh, so stay tuned for our announcement of the next round of the ESG Positive Impact Awards. Thank you again, uh, everyone, for joining us today. And a big thank you to TM and OCBC Bank for supporting and making this webinar possible, as well as the Ministry of Natural Resources, Environment and Climate Change for their endorsement of this seminar and also of the ESG Positive Impact Awards that uh, STAR ha um, has uh, gone the first round um, in 2022 and uh, 23. For those who would like to rewatch this morning's session, you'll be able to do so on our Starbeast Facebook page. Um, so that will be, um, you can rewatch it at your own leisure and uh, the slides will be there as well. So yeah, have a good day, take care and stay safe everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye bye everyone. Please complete the poll. <laughs> we need your feedback. <laughs>
fruit. The panelists can also stop the videos and yeah. Bye, Datuk. <laughs> okay, bye bye.